All right, welcome and good evening. We are delighted to have you in our service this evening, and we're looking forward to spending this time together and being challenged from the Word of God. So we're glad that you're here, and we want to welcome uh, folks that are uh, viewing with us on Facebook and on YouTube. That's a great blessing to have uh, the extended outreach and folks joining us in that way. So we welcome you. Uh, let us know if you're on Facebook uh, by means of the comments that you're here. And uh, good to have uh, each of our folks in attendance in our service tonight. And so we are uh, in the uh, Quieting a Noisy Soul series. We were starting this in Sunday school and then moved it over to our Wednesday night time. And so uh, glad to have you uh, on this uh, evening study, session number 15. And so the, the last two lessons have been on our conscience. And so uh, nothing between our soul and the Savior, as our songwriter uh, wrote the song. And so uh, having a heart that's right with God. Uh, Paul said that he worked very diligently uh, to have no offense between God and man. And so two times ago, session that would have been 13, we're on 15 tonight. So on session 13, just the importance of a clear conscience, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, uh, to have a clear, uh, open access fellowship and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, last week, it was taking care of our side of an offense. Even if someone initiated an offense... Um, you can't control what the other person is or isn't going to do or how they're feeling about it or what have you. And as God uh, convicts you and shows you your need, uh, there's something you can do on your part. And so we looked last week at clearing our side of the wedge, our side of the problem. This evening, we're going to be dealing with how do you deal uh, with the other side uh, when an offense has been caused uh, does, okay, Jesus said, turn the other cheek, you know, uh, and I think that shows love and, and forbearance and, and brotherly kindness and so on, uh, but we must not uh, sweep sin under the carpet, and so there's a right way of going about things, there's a wrong way about going about things, and so this evening's study uh, is specifically on this subject, dealing with the other side of the wedge. So I'm going to pray. And uh, we'll get started with our video uh, time uh, this evening with Dr. Jim Berg. Uh, when we come back, we'll do a little bit of follow-up with that. And then uh, we'll take praises and prayer requests and have a time of prayer. So, uh, again, glad to have you here this evening. Let's bow for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you have given us an opportunity uh, to know our God and, Lord, to know you uh, ever more uh, personally and intimately and experientially, uh, Lord, experiencing the love and the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness and the blessing that we have in knowing and loving and serving you. And uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, the admonition, uh, admonition uh, for each of our hearts uh, to be right and to get things right uh, with you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us with our relationships. It's uh, easy to uh, excuse our own faults away and, and magnify uh, the faults of others. Uh, but truly, there's a right way uh, that you would have us to uh, uh, make ourselves right with you and with others, and then things that we can do uh, that would help uh, bring about uh, forgiveness and reconciliation and uh, uh, renewed fellowship. Uh, Lord, may we be uh, peacemakers and not stumbling blocks in the area of relationships. And so continue to teach us from your word. Help us to apply this in important areas of our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is session 15, dealing with the other side of the wedge. We just spent some time on how to deal with your side of the wedge. And a couple more comments I want to make um, about that. When I came to college, I mentioned earlier, I was in great rebellion, and I had a lot of things to clear up. And when I got right with God, I had to sit down with a, a legal pad 
And I filled three pages of people I had to see, money I had to pay back, goods I had to restore, folks I had to get right with. And when I looked at that, I, I, I told God, I don't, I don't care what I have to do. I just have to be right with you, and I have to be right with other people. And I'll tell you, that that's probably, to this day, the most humbling thing I've ever done in my life, was go back to my school principal. I'd stolen hundreds of dollars of drafting equipment from them. This is back in the 70s when hundreds of dollars meant a whole lot more than it means today. And from businesses in town, from my employer, from my friends, I had things to get right with my parents, I had to get right with my uh, brother that I had offended in uh, leading him the wrong direction in those days. And go back to some of the people that I had run with and sinned with and ask them for forgiveness. And it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing. What we're describing in this is not an easy thing. It's a humbling thing. But I'm convinced I probably would have been expelled from Bob Jones University for stealing had gotten, God not taken me through that process. Because there were times when I was tempted to steal, when I would think, if I, ever, if I do this and, get right with, and ever get right with God again, I'm going to be back in the store talking to this manager. And I've already, done, I've already done that. I don't ever want to do that again. And I'm convinced one of the reasons we keep going back into sin is that we don't face it with the people we need to face it with and endure the shame of it that God will use while we're weak. Now, today I don't steal for some whole different reasons. But when I was weak, the only thing that kept me from stealing is the shame of it, of having to go get it right. Because I had the sneaking suspicion that I'd probably end up getting right with God sometime along the line. And I have to talk with these people again. And I didn't want to do that. And I'm not, what, I'm, what I'm saying here, this is not an easy thing. But it's crucial for our own growth in Christ. And we're going to talk about how to get grace from God to do those hard things in, another, in the next session. But we have to be willing to do what God commands. And he says, if, you, if there are people that you have wronged and you bring your gift to the altar, then go get that right. And you will be amazed. I, I, I cannot tell you the relief I felt every time I was able to check off one of those names and cross that out and say, thank God that's over. And the burden when the whole thing was done. Now, interesting process. After a while I was going through that, God continued to bring other things to mind. The, the list continued to grow as I worked on it. But that's all right. He says, when you begin to bear fruit in John 15, he'll purge you to bear more fruit, and he'd bring more things to my mind. And it took me two years to pay back everybody that I owed. But folks, it's worth every moment of it to be right with God and to be right with other people. And we have to take seriously God's command to remove our side of the wedge. And then we can help others remove their side of the wedge, and that's what we come to here in session 15. The goal here is to help the other person become reconciled with God so that he will seek reconciliation with you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, and, which is yelling and evil speaking or slander, be put away from you along with all malice and be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. When, when God and others have forgiven you much, you don't have any trouble extending forgiveness. My freshman year, I went up to, ironically or providentially, I should say, to the same office where I sit now with another dean behind that desk. And I confessed to him enough things to get me expelled about two or three times over. And because it was entirely private, nobody knew about it, and it didn't have to go any further beyond that because it was entirely a private matter. I got mercy. And I tell you what, any time a student comes to my office and wants to get right with God, I delight in giving the same kind of thing. If you have been forgiven, you don't mind forgiving. Now, there are other things that I did that I had to take some consequences for. As I mentioned, there are a lot of things I had, people I had to see, a lot of public shame in some of those things. But when you have been forgiven, you don't mind forgiving. And that's one of the things we're going to learn here. 
some steps to granting forgiveness to others. When somebody has wronged us, there's a God-honoring way to deal with the offense. He must be confronted about his offense so that he can ask forgiveness from you so that you can grant it and thus restoring the relationship and you can help him be restored to God. Before you go to that brother, however, there's some actions you need to take toward God. Kind of, there these, some of these things we've already talked about a little bit and perhaps just stated here in a little different way. The first point is surrender to God your assumed right to demand payment. Now anytime somebody wrongs us, we feel like they owe us something. We might say in, in, in the vernacular, he owes me an apology, he owes me an explanation, he owes me payback for that, he stole from me, he owes me that back. And, and we have this sense when somebody has wronged us that they owe something and, that demand, and, and, the, and we are demanding a payment from that. Well, the first thing we have to do is go to God and surrender to him any assumed right for payment and have before God a spirit of forgiveness where I'm willing to forgive that person the moment he asks. In fact, that is uh, what God is addressing, what Jesus is addressing in Matthew 6 about having a spirit of forgiveness. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I want to read this, this passage in Matthew 18 because it is so foundational. Matthew 18, 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And he thought that was being quite generous. And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, or depending on the, the, the measure there, probably about $12 million. I mean, this is a staggering debt, especially for a house steward. $12 million he extorted. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children all that he had in payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Now that's pretty optimistic. You know, just be patient and I'll be able to pay all this back. How in the world is he going to pay back 12 million bucks? That's optimism, folks. But the Lord is trying to make a point here. Verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. That's about twelve dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Same thing he had said. It says, And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. Is he calling him wicked because he extorted $12 million? No, he's calling him wicked because he won't forgive somebody else. He says, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? And Jesus said, when you have experienced forgiveness, that ought to change your spirit about forgiveness entirely when somebody else comes to you. And we'll see some of the consequences that the Lord imposes when that doesn't take place. Mark eleven twenty five to 26 Jesus said, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And Romans 12, 17 to 20, recompense to no man evil for evil. In other words, never pay back evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That, that literally means plan such a response to his evil to you. Plan such a response that any onlooker would see you as honorable. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So the first thing we have to do is say, God, I want to have a kind of spirit toward this person that you have had toward me. And when, when I came to you, you were ready to forgive, and I want to be ready to forgive this person when he comes to me. You've, you have forgiven me a debt of hell. I'm willing to forgive him anything he asked me of. People say, well, he had, you have no idea how he hurt me. He didn't put you through hell, literally. I mean, there was, it, was, it may have been very bad. I'm not, I'm, not under, I'm not underestimating that. But it wasn't eternal hell 
That's what you and I put Jesus Christ through. And that's what he paid for us. And he forgave it just because we asked. A $12 million debt, unpayable to any of us. When anybody else comes along with a 12 buck debt, we ought to be able to forgive that. Matthew 5, we, we, God commands us to pray for the offender's good. This is another thing we do. In Matthew 5, 43 to 48, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then he said, because, you, because you'll be acting like the Father this way, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth his rain on the just and the unjust, for if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, or all-including, all-encompassing, even as your Father is all-encompassing, as he's perfect, is what that word means. Luke 23, 34, Jesus prayed for the people who offended him when he said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, Jesus is not asking the Father to grant amnesty to everybody down there. The only terms for which God can forgive sin is repentance. So what is Jesus praying? Father, bring them all to the position of repentance where you can forgive them their sins. That right now, they don't know what they're doing. Open their eyes. Help them see what they're doing so they can repent and you can forgive them. He's praying for their reconciliation to the Father. That's what Stephen did when he was martyred in Acts 7.60. And Stephen, kneeling down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Same attitude. He's praying for their ultimate good, that they would come to repentance and God would be able to forgive them then. Those are the actions we take toward God. Now there's some actions we need to take toward the offender. First of all, feed your enemy while he is estranged. In other words, be doing him good while he's still estranged from you. Romans 12, 20 to 21, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Your actions will bring heap shames, uh, uh, piles of shame and guilt on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's quoting the Old Testament in Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. 1 Samuel 24, 17, and King Saul said to David, David had just confronted Saul. And, and uh, from, from a distance, from, over across the valley, and he had, uh, he had some of Saul's belongings, showing to Saul that I could have killed you tonight, but I didn't. And he said to Saul, Saul, look, I could have done you in, but I didn't. Why are you after me? I am not after you. I am not a threat to you. And what does Saul say? But David is doing good to him. And what does Saul say? And King Saul said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And here's another interesting thing. While Saul is chasing David around the mountain and chasing him around to these cities and out in these forests, you know what David is doing in his spare time? burning Philistine villages. What is he doing? He's advancing the kingdom of Saul. All the while, Saul is after him. That's godliness in action, folks. You have somebody who's mistreating you? Help advance his kingdom. That's exactly what God is saying here, that you don't recompense evil for evil, but contrarywise blessing. Do good to them that, that use you in this way. And David was doing that. David was making uh, Saul successful while well, Saul's trying to kill David. That's this spirit that our Lord is talking about. Surrender your assumed right to demand payment. Establish that forgiving spirit. Pray for him. Another thing, rebuke the offender in meekness. This is where we like to start, at least the rebuke part. Um, without the other things. And we need, to do, we need to have the right spirit when we go, and we need to be praying for them and, and having a spirit of doing good to them, and then rebuke the offender in meekness. If the, if the offense is a personal offense against you, see him privately. The purpose is to gain thy brother. The purpose of the rebuke is to help the other person see his offense so that he will ask you to forgive him. That's why you're going. You're not going to say... I just want him to understand how he's made me feel all these years. That's not the purpose. Who's, who's being served by that? What is the motivation behind that? 
That's a selfish motive. You're sowing in the flesh. You're just going to reap more corruption out of this thing. I said, well, I just got to get this off my chest. I can't sleep. I'm going to get this off my chest. God said, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. I'm going to let him have it right now. I'm not going to wait for the sun to go down on it. You know, all right, what, what kind of motive is behind that? I just got to get this off my chest. I get it. No, 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 no. You plan a response that is honorable in the sight of all men, Romans 12 says. And that doesn't mean calling him in the middle of the night and waking him up and letting him have your two cents worth to get it off your chest so you can sleep tonight. Now, you wouldn't be doing that if you were praying for your offender, if you were doing good for, to your offender. The purpose of the rebuke is to help the other person see his offense so that he will ask God to forgive him. You know, if we have, uh, if we have a neighbor that is unsaved and we're trying to get him to come to Christ and we're really burdened about him and he has a dog who comes over and makes daily deposits in our lawn. And nobody comes from the other side of the fence. Your neighbor doesn't come over and clean that up. What do you do? Well, you, you, you gather that, keep it, and put it on his doorstep one, you know, a couple of months worth. I just want you to know how this feels. <laughs> Smells, I should say. No, that's not what we do. If we're trying to reach that man for Christ, we, we pick that up every day and, and by that demonstrate good. And maybe he's a little bit antagonistic. He said, well, he'll just think I'm a doormat. No, Jesus said he'll think you're like him. This is what the Father does. Now, I think you can understand. You can feel what kind of, what kind of uh, you, you can think about what kind of spirit we need to have toward that neighbor. Think about our own family. Let's say you have, a, you have a, a teenager who's not being really helpful and not really being follow, not following the family in, in what you want the family to do and he's disobeying and things like that. We need to have the same spirit toward that teenager as we would toward that neighbor. If we really are trying to bring about reconciliation to people, we don't do things that will bring unnecessary offense and make it hard for them to come to Christ. And if we treated our neighbor, our unsaved neighbor, the way we treat our teenagers sometimes, or another Christian brother, that neighbor would never come to Christ. And that's why sometimes our kids don't either. We've erected such huge stumbling blocks in their lives. Yes, they've got their own sin and they've got their own problems, but we've got to get our side of the wedge removed. And then we've got to rebuke them in, such a, in meekness, in such a way that it would make it most likely for them to repent. I, I want to, even if I have to go to that neighbor, and, and maybe for some reason we really can't have that, that dog stuff in the yard, and uh, I need to ask, I need to talk with him about it. I'm going to try to address that problem in such a way that it doesn't hinder my future attempts to deal with the gospel with him. And we need to do that with other people that we deal with our children, our neighbors, other folks in the church, deal with them in such a way that it's not adding to the offense and making it hard for them to come around to Christ. Though you have surrendered to God any assumed right to demand payment and you have, an and you have a forgiving spirit toward him, you cannot extend forgiveness to him until he asks for it. This is how God deals with us. Now that's a real important thing. God doesn't just look over this whole earth and say, all right, I'm, I'm a forgiving God. You all, you all are scot-free. He didn't say that. The only time he forgives us is when we come and ask. He has a spirit ready to forgive anybody the moment they ask, but he doesn't forgive them until they ask. And it's not helping the other person's restoration. If you just go to somebody who's wrong and say, I just want to tell you that, that um, I, I've forgiven you, for all the things you've done. You can't forgive him for what you can't. You can forgive in your heart to God that you give up all of this assumed right to demand payment and have a spirit that when you go approach him, you're willing to forgive him the moment he asks. But your reason for going to ask, talk to him is to rebuke him for his sin so that he will ask you for forgiveness and you, can, and you can grant it. But God does not grant forgiveness to us until we ask, until we repent. 
And the goal in going to that brother is to get him restored to God. And he can't be restored to God until he asks you for forgiveness and asks God for forgiveness. So don't just go and say, I forgive you. He's not right with God, and he's not right with you. He hasn't asked any forgiveness. And that's our goal, to get him right with God and us again. That's our pattern. That's the way God deals with us. But the spirit is one of meekness in Galatians 6.1. Paul underscores this when he says, If you see a brother overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In Luke 17, 3 to 4, he tells us to rebuke. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Now, do you understand what the Lord just did here? He just gave you and me as Christians a command. If your brother trespasses against you, the command from Jesus is rebuke him. Now, why is he saying that? Because that guy's out of fellowship with God himself until he's restored with you. And the command from, to you and me from Jesus Christ himself is when somebody trespasses against you, you've got to go talk to him. You can't just let this hang. Now, there are many human weaknesses and so forth that need to be forborne. You know, if somebody, if, if somebody um, doesn't greet you the way you would like to be greeted, you know, work, you don't say, you know, you know you're, I need to talk to you. You're not really being Christ-like. You didn't smile at me. Yeah, I mean, there are just a lot of stuff like that. It just needs to be foreborn. But when that person has done something that puts him out of fellowship with God in his offense toward you, then you and I have a command from Jesus Christ to get involved in his life so that he is restored to God and he's restored to us. This Luke 17.3 isn't just a suggested procedure is a command. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. That also is a command. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn unto thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Say, well, yeah, that can't be real sincere if he's coming seven times in a day. Well, we don't know that. Jesus didn't say you have, you have to measure his sincerity. He said when he comes, you have to do this. Now, his repeated offense against you seven times in a day or more may reveal that he has some other needs in his life that need to be taken care of and, and addressed in his life because he continues in the same pattern of sin. So that doesn't mean you don't get involved in his life trying to help him. He's got this offense over and over and over and over again. Well, you forgive him, but you, then that's when you start moving in and saying, brother, we really do have a problem here. This shouldn't be happening seven times a day. I'm happy to forgive you. God has forgiven me more than seven times a day, but we've got to work on something here so this doesn't happen seven times a day. I want to help you. And he may need some of the corrective action we talked about, the radical amputation and, and the restriction and, and uh, restitution and all of those kinds of things to help him so he's not falling back into sin so often. And we do all of that not to make him pay, but to help him grow. By the way, when we discipline our children, it isn't to make them pay. It's to help them grow. Even, even a spanking isn't to make them pay. Spankings have a wonderful way of improving memory. They do. And it is to help them grow so they don't get into this again. It's not to make them pay. I'll show you. I'll make, I'll make you pay for that. You'll pay for that if you do that again. That's not Christ's spirit. He doesn't chasten us to make us pay. He chastens us to help us grow. Just some ideas here. A study how God rebuked Cain in Genesis 4, 6 to 7. We're talking about how to rebuke, how Abigail rebuked David. That is an exercise in, in um, wonderful persuasion, godly persuasion. How David rebuked King Saul. That, those are tremendous testimonies of godly persuasion, godly rebuke, and how Nathan rebuked King David. And would you note this next statement? So many family members... Church members and Christian co-workers wrong others by their harsh words, vindictive actions, and manipulative ways, and never seek to make it right with those they have wronged. 
And I've already talked about this a little bit. The next day they act as if nothing has happened. This blight in the body of Christ and hindrance to Christian love and fellowship must be addressed. The offender cannot be allowed to continue in his state of distance from God and others because of his sin. And folks, you can teach your children that. You know, when the kids are really little, even three and five years old, and they're, they're arguing, they're into a fight, it's very easy to, to just manage the behavior. And you tell one of them, you go to that side of the room, and you go to that side of the room, and don't you even look at each other or your history. You know, we can manage that behavior, but that doesn't teach them anything about reconciliation. You know what you need to do? You take that little three-year-old and that five-year-old, and you sit them down on the couch, and you bend down on your knees and, and get right in front of them, eyeball to eyeball, and you say to that three-year-old, I want to ask you a question. When you hit your sister with that hairbrush, are you pleasing Jesus or were you pleasing yourself? And we had to do this in our house. And the three-year-old would go, I, I, was, I was pleasing myself. And you say, all right, because you were pleasing yourself instead of Jesus, what do you need to tell Jesus? Dear Jesus, I'm sorry. I forgive me. Would you forgive me for pleasing myself? And saying, what do you need? And, and, and then you turn to the five-year-old and you say, I want to ask you a question. When you hit her back, were you pleasing Jesus or pleasing yourself? And then she's lost it. She's, I was pleasing myself. What do you need to tell your sister? And she says, I was wrong for pleasing myself. Would you forgive me? What do you need to tell Jesus? I was wrong for pleasing myself instead of you. Would you? And you know what you've done in that process, folks? You've taught biblical reconciliation between God and men. Now, that's not, a, that, that's not real efficient. I mean, sending him to each side of the room, and you may have to separate him. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But sending him to the other side of the room, you can take care of that problem fast, but you haven't taught them a thing, except right now. Mom's really having a moment. That's all they get out of that. Don't do anything else right now. You know, wait till mom's in a better mood or not around. That's all that says. You have not taught them one spiritual lesson. And folks, a three-year-old can get that. A five-year-old can get that. That's biblical reconciliation. And if a home is operating in a godly fashion, you ought to be hearing that all throughout the week at different times of the week. Them saying to one another, or saying to you, or you saying to them, you know the way I spoke to you a few minutes ago? I was out of line. I was self-centered. I was hurtful. Would you forgive me? That ought to go on constantly in a home. I mean, there's enough friction in a home to keep that going on a lot. And I tell you what, when that starts happening, it cuts down on a lot of this stuff because you start thinking what you've got to do to make this right with God and others. The offender cannot be allowed to continue in this state of distance from God and others because of his sin. Number two, if he refuses to hear you, take another brother with you. That's Matthew 18, 16. And again, the purpose there is to establish that you're trying to make reconciliation and establish that he's resistant. Number three, forgive him when he repents. Noise in the soul is often the result of an unforgiving, bitter spirit. This attitude reigns when the believer either has not surrendered to God his assumed right to demand payment, or he refuses to grant forgiveness when it is sought by the other party. Jesus addressed this issue at length in the parable of Matthew 18, 23 to 35. We read that. The ungrateful servant was dealt with strongly because he failed to forgive a small debt owed by a fellow servant after he himself had been forgiven an unpayable debt. I didn't read this to you, but in Matthew 18, the last two verses says, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And then this penetrating statement, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do to you. Do what? Deliver you to torment until you from your heart forgive everyone his brother his trespasses. You know what God says? I will allow you to be tormented. That word in the Greek means to be tormented in mind and body. It was used of, of, of a cyclone whipping up Paul's ship. And there are a lot of people with some very distressing physical condition and some very distressing spiritual conditions. And they say, what is going on? I remember a girl in, in, uh, in college she had spent so much time in the hospital. She was just sick all the time with, un, with you know, un, undiscoverable problems. And I went to talk with her, and, and uh, as I talked with her and about her family and so forth, it became very bitter, very obvious that she was very bitter. And her dad was a very difficult man to live with. He had the personality of a Brillo pad, you know, just always abrasive. And she said, I will not forgive him. And I read her this passage, and I said, have you ever felt like you're just being harassed and tormented all the time? She said, yes. And I said, God's keeping his promise. He will keep his promise. He, if you are unforgiving, he will deliver you to torment. 
Many afflictions of the emotions and body lie right here in God's promise to torment unforgiving believers. Forgiveness removes the wedge entirely, but still may leave the parties at some distance. And the forgiven believer still may require corrective action for his growth, but his request for forgiveness and your granting of it establishes fellowship with him again. Number four, help him face any corrective measures involved. He may have to make restitution. He may have to be under some restriction or radical amputation, as we discussed in the last session. Help, help him work out the plans. He may need to talk to his boss. He may need to talk to his parents or to talk to his spouse or whatever, but help him with those plans. He may have to be under some corrective action. And that's not being unmerciful. That's helping him grow. And number five, apply church discipline if he refuses to be reconciled. Church discipline is never applied for the basic offense, but for stubbornly refusing to be reconciled to God and others after much effort to restore him. And then rebuild the relationship so that brotherly love is the defining hallmark of the relationship as we saw in John 13. And it's not enough just to get that wedge out. Folks, these two have to work at coming up with a relationship here as much as possible as lieth within you, as, as Romans says. God, God is looking for an exchange here. That, that, that animosity and all of that that was and that, that uh, bitterness that was there before, that that has been exchanged now for unity, which will demonstrate that they truly are the children of God. The badge that they are followers of Jesus Christ. It's not just removing wedges. It's exchanging the relationship of what it was before to something entirely new, which reflects what goes on in salvation. That there's, a, there's something new that is going on here. And the conclusion here, to repeat the conclusion we've had in the last three sessions, the loudest noises in the soul are the agitations of a guilty conscience. The way out starts with confession and cleansing so we can have a conscience void of offense toward God and men. Now, now we're going to look at some other issues in, in, in the coming sessions about anxiety and anger and despair but folks, there is absolutely no use in trying to have any kind of victories in those areas when we're covering sin and God can't bless us. And God won't give us grace, which we're going to talk about in the next session. If you're out of fellowship with God and you're out of fellowship with other believers, that is priority number one. That's why the subtitle of this whole series is called Overcoming Guilt, Anxiety, Anger, and Despair. We start with dealing with our guilt before God and our guilt before either. And imagine, folks, what our families and our churches would be like if we were rebuking other people who were wronging us in a spirit of meekness and trying to get them restored to God, if we were giving forgiveness to other people who are asking us, we're seeking forgiveness with other people, imagine what the church would be like. The world would have to sit up and take notice once again. Once more, they would have to say, my, how they love one another. And they said that in the first century. And they could say that now if we would be obedient to these things. The world would have to sit up and take notice once again. Once more, they would have to say, My, how they love one another. Just uh, excellent, uh, practical, and very, very helpful, convicting, uh, but very, very helpful material. And I would like to encourage you, uh, review last week's lesson, which was on um, taking care of our side of the offense, which is repentance, starts there. Uh, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Um, and restoration, uh, restitution. He spoke of radical amputation. If there's, you know, some areas that just need to have some guardrails put on, or accountability, or uh, just some of those kinds of things, removing certain things if there's wrong habits and so on. But taking care of our side of the wedge, and then tonight's material, uh, taking care of the other side of the wedge. And when you look out in our society, and I know we need to just look right here, and look in our own hearts and in our own relationships. But for just a moment to look out at what we see in our culture 
And, and we see the bitterness. We see the anger. We see the angst. You know, I'll never forgive them and, and so on. And, and that comes over to us. We, we learn that from others. <laughs> we learn it from our own uh, bad habits and so on. And so this is wonderfully helpful uh, and we need to put it into practice. I would just encourage you, if this is your first time to go through this particular material, or um, uh, hopefully you've heard these kinds of principles before, and, and, it's, and it's getting reinforced and, and reminding us. Uh, Peter said, you know, I keep reminding and keep going over this and so on. We need the reminders, and uh, we're in a fresh season of life. We're in a fresh uh, set of circumstances, a fresh set of relationships and so on, and so God always wants us to be working uh, right where we are. So um, let me encourage you to uh, go back through uh, some of these uh, notes that uh, maybe uh, really spoke to your heart, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us to grow in these areas. Isn't it wonderful that God wants our fellowship? You know, He wants our fellowship. It's what it's all about. He doesn't want the strain. He doesn't want uh, us to push him away. He, he, he keeps drawing us back, and then he wants us uh, to be right with each other, and he gives us means and opportunities and principles uh, to put into practice. So God is good, and let's ask the Lord to help us. Um, just by way of announcement, uh, put the bulletin and the, um, the prayer bulletin and the handout in your email, so hopefully you, you have that or can uh, go back and find that. Uh, please keep praying for our missionaries, and we continue to uh, hear from them as they, as they send in their, their uh, prayer letters and, and updates and so on. And so this week we're praying for uh, the Bush family in Texas as they start uh, starting Point Baptist Church in a, in a suburb of Houston. Uh, the coal trains are still, I haven't had word that they have been able to get cleared to go back to the Philippines. Things are opening up. They were in the States to take care of, I believe it was David's father's estate type of thing. His father passed away, and then th everything shut down with COVID. So they have been able to uh, do Facebook things and so on, uh, which is amazing. Uh, but pray for the coal trains to get back on their field in the Philippines. Uh, the frues are on um, uh, furlough uh, for the remaining of a the year. They're going back over this fall. And uh, so pray for them. They're, they're missionaries to Hungary. The Gatanas, missionaries to the deaf in Zambia, Africa. Uh, Mrs. Dorothy Halsey. Uh, the Bill Hendersons in Guam, uh, Jack and Johnny Hunt Aviation uh, Services and then the Conorups in Nairobi. So please keep these and all of our missionaries in prayer, and uh, we thank the Lord for what God is doing uh, as we hear of, of the missionary outreach that they have. All right, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, I'll end this service with a short word of prayer, and then if you have prayer requests and praises right here in our in-person attendance, if you have uh, praises and prayer requests. Let's share those. We'll have a time of prayer. Uh, if you have prayer requests there at home, uh, please let us know how we can be praying with you for that. Let me encourage you to spend some time in prayer right there at home. Let's bow for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this service. We thank you for this wonderful Bible teaching. Uh, Lord, thank you that you have uh, given us not only the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us for salvation, and forgiveness of, of eternal punishment from sin. But Lord, thank you that we can be right with you moment by moment. And I pray that tonight our hearts would be challenged and convicted uh, to be sure that we uh, do not have that which is between our soul and the Savior in personal fellowship with you. And if so, to make those things right, that that would be the case. And then Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, in areas where uh, uh, offenses have occurred and, and wrongs have been committed. Lord, give us the mind and heart of Christ. Uh, help us to take appropriate steps. And Lord, would you win even the hardest uh, heart, uh, maybe uh, a family member or friend or loved one or co-worker uh, that has hardened their heart against uh, one of us here, and uh, strained a relationship. Lord, uh, help us to do what we can on our side of the wedge. Help us, Lord, to, to think through and pray through and then work through uh, properly uh, how we could 
uh, show the brotherly love of Christ and address uh, offenses in a biblical and proper way uh, with the result that that person would be uh, uh, right with God and, and right with each other. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for these Bible principles. Uh, bless us now as we go to this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.